mainly autophagy has a system but how protein degradation is controlled by signaling pathways in skeletal muscle and mainly as you can see by these slides all our study are performing in vivo in order to have a very a real, a real physiological uh, and a translation into medical field and the last part of my talk I will present how basic scientists or basic science can be translated to medical problems in skeletal muscle and may be very close to some therapeutic approach to patients. Um, mainly skeletal muscle, if you're not familiar, is a pretty peculiar cell. First of all, it's, an, it's a synthetic cell. Mainly, this means that uh, one cell contains hundreds of nuclei, all together packed in one cell. Second peculiarity is that the muscle the, our, the cytoplasm is filled by mainly contractile elements, proteins, that are organized in the motor unit that is called the sarcomer, where myosin and actin can interact with each other, and this interaction allows the contraction, the shoulder and muscle, so we can move our arms and our limbs. Uh, but this very organized structure needs uh, some uh, a peculiar signal, calcium that is coming from uh, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and the energy that's coming from mitochondria. And energy, calcium, protein has to be extremely well organized into a cell. Changing the shape and the localization of the organelles and then cotata elements has a major impact in muscle strength and muscle mass. And I will show you some data about how this uh, peculiar organization is important and can signal to the degradation machinery. Mainly you have to be uh, familiar or you are familiar or have, you, have, you have to know that the muscles are not all identical. You have different fiber type into the same muscle and the muscle could be uh, divided in two different types. The uh, bodybuilder muscle, the muscle become very big when you exercise, that are extremely poor in mitochondria but and they are fulfilled of contractile elements. They use glycogen mainly as a source of energy for glycolysis. This muscle are very can generate a, a robust strength, but they can be uh, maintain the contraction only for a few, for a short time. They become very soon, uh, they, they, they have a very soon fatigue. Uh, this muscle becomes bigger or smaller very soon, but if you exercise, you stop to exercise. The type 1 muscle instead are the typical for the marathon, so are muscles that can use very for a long time contraction. They have mainly, uh, uh, they are rich in mitochondria, they can sustain contraction, but the strength is not so high as the strength that can be generated by this muscle. This muscle are pretty resistant to muscle loss, and they are pretty resistant also to degeneration in some conditions like muscle dystrophies and the Duchenne dystrophies. So they have two different peculiar fiber types into the same muscle and some muscle can be extremely rich in this type of fiber and other muscle can be extremely rich in this type of fiber. When you exercise, you modulate the shifting from one fiber to the other. If you are running marathon, you are recruiting the type 2 fiber becoming type 1 fiber. If you are lifting weight and do a, a, an aerobic exercise, you are changing your type 1 fiber into a type 2 fiber. And mainly when you are going to exercise, you are going to uh, increase the muscle mass, there is a signaling pathway that controls the translational machinery, and this is mainly due to a hormone's close uh, that is a similar or is going to the same pathway. It's called uh, insulin growth factor 1 or IGF-1 that can activate downstream kinase, AKT, that uh, has another target downstream is mTOR, and mTOR is important for affecting the ribosome translation. So when you go to the gym, your muscle becomes bigger because you produce more contractile elements that start to assemble into a sarcomer. But you need also energy, and this cofactor is important for mitochondria and uh, bioenergetic. So mitochondria start to increase in your muscle because this cofactor is the master genes for mitochondria biogenesis called PPR gamma coactivator one, alpha is called also PGC1 alpha. And it's very ex extremely sensitive to exercise or disease. However, you are familiar that if you stop to exercise, you get a disease because you stay in bed, because you have a flu or you have a broken arm, so you have a cast. Now your muscles start to become weaker and smaller, mainly because degradation starts to occur and you are removing your contractile elements and uh, now the muscle becomes smaller and weaker. Uh, just to keep in mind that we, if you stay in bed for days and you have still a nutritional support, support you still lose uh, muscle mass and proteins and kilograms of protein, not grams of protein. 
So if you have a still a nutritional control, you have the appropriate uh, amino acid, glucose, lipids, mm, and, but you don't load your muscle, you exercise your muscle, you are losing protein because this regulation system is ready to go and if you don't inhibit uh, because you're not exercising your muscle, it starts to destroy your protein. So okay, it's clear that protein can be removed. The problem is that what happens to the mitochondria and the network of organelles and sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is the system that removes the, the, the organelles. And mainly you have to keep in mind that proteins, 90% of the proteins in every cell, independent from skeletal muscle, could be hepatocyte, neurons, uh, pancreas, beta cells, uh, are controlled by these two degradation proteolytic, proteolytic system, the ubiquitin proteasome and the autophagy lasma system. Just to keep uh, a little bit of touch about the ubiquitin protein system, uh, you have to keep in mind that when you're losing muscle mass, it's not only because you activate the degradation system via post-translational modification, but you activate a program in which a subset of genes uh, uh, are always up or down regulated. If you compare the gene expression profile in different diseases, which have in common only muscle loss, so chronic renal failure, diabetes, uh, fasting, uh, disease, uh, cancer, cachexia, you will find that there is a an, an hundred, more or less 100, 120 genes uh, that are always up or down regulated in all these conditions. And these genes, uh, since these conditions have only common muscle loss, these genes should be important for the control of muscle mass. And so are called atrophy-related genes. And in fact, the two most induced genes uh, were two novel ubiquitin ligases called atrogen 1 or MUFBOX and MERF1. And the, the knockout animals for these two genes uh, are spared from muscle loss during the nervation fasting. And that's in, keep in mind that these genes are always upregulated. Why? Because there is transcription factor that is uh, blocked by the same pathway that show you important for muscle growth uh, that is uh, able to induce, sorry, muscle atrophy is sufficient and required to induce muscle atrophy because is the transcription factor that control the expression of this ubiquitin like is atrogen 1 MERF1. Just inducing FOXO, you induce the expression of atrogen 1 MERF1. And this FOXO is blocked by AKT. So when you're going to the and exercise your muscle in the gym, you are promoting muscle growth. At the same time, you are suppressing the degradation of the ubiquitin proteasome system. Just to remind you that the ubiquitin ligase are the rate limiting enzyme in the step of the ubiquitination. These enzymes are, uh, uh, are the enzymes that are important to move the ubiquitin from the E2, the conjugation system, to the substrate, the protein that has to be degraded. And then do it and labeling the, the substrate with a polyubiquitin chain that always is, is performed by at least four ubiquitin proteins. And when the substrate has a polybutin chain, it is immediately destroyed by the proteasome system. So if you change the level of this ubiquitin uh, ligase, you change the, uh, the rate of the ubiquitination step. So increasing the, the ubiquitin ligase, you increase the ubiquitination and you increase the degradation of the substrate. But today, I don't want to talk about this. I would like to talk about the autophagy lesion system. That is uh, the uh, recent, uh, there's a fashion, there's a much interest about this system. Why? Because this system is important for different aspects in the cell. And the autophagy is divided in three different types of autophagy. The macro autophagy. This means that some vesicles, membranes, start, are committed by some protein, here in green, LC3, to become vesicles. They start to elongate a growth surrounding cytosol or proteins, aggregates, organelles, engulfing into a double layer vesicle. So have a double phospholipid layer. And these uh, vesicles now is docked to the lysosome, fused with the membrane of the lysosome, and all what is inside is destroyed by the acidic hydrolase in the lysosome while some protein of the autophagosome are recycled to start a new uh, autophagosome formation and uh, um, cycle. This is called a macroautophagy, but there is also the microautophagy. And this means that the lysosome that engulf a small portion of the cytoplasm and uh, into a vesicle, then, then is destroyed by the uh, acidic hydrolase. 
This form of microautophagy is less studied and seems to be important for skeletal muscle to destroy glycogen and release glucose. And the last one is the, called the chaperone mediated autophagy, in which chaperones are important to destroy proteins. Proteins has to be has to contain a sequence. This sequence, KFERQ, is present in almost 30%, one third of the protein in the cell has this sequence. So these proteins, when they are damaged, maybe by oxidative stress, they expose the sequence, and this sequence is recognized by a chaperone called H head shock complex 70 that binds the sequence and dock the protein to a receptor placed in the lysosome, it's called LAM2A receptor, and now the protein is pushed into the lysosome and destroyed by the acetic hydrolase. And this complex can recycle to, again, uh, deliver other proteins to the lysosome. Uh, today I will uh, uh, show our data about the macroautophagy that I will call from now to the end as autophagy. But remind that autophagy has, contains also the macroautophagy and the chaperone autophagy. And mainly, as I told you, uh, membranes start to grow surrounding what has to be destroyed by the lysosome, and the membrane commitment and growth requires many proteins. Uh, more or less in the East are 30, 32 proteins, the genes that are involved in this process, and in mammals are much more because each gene can have different splice variant and isoforms. But as you can see, the protein has different color. There's only one protein in green that's present outside and inside the vesicles. And this protein is called LC3. And this is the only protein, as you can see by this uh, uh, round shape uh, together with uh, this uh, dot, that is uh, able to be bound to bind covalent bonding to the phospholipids. The other protein do, do not have uh, such covalent binding to phospholipids. So we can, and this protein is present from the early stage to the late stage of the autophagism formation. So this is a perfect marker if we want to analyze the autophagy system, if we want to monitor the autophagy. Why? So the proteins start to be recruited in the membrane, will have a covalent binding, so the lipidation steps occur. And lipidation can be monitored by SDS page and Western blood because the protein change the molecular weight. When it's free, has a higher molecular weight. When it's bound to lipids, has a phospholipid binding, become uh, faster in, the, in the SDS page. So the, the changing in the shape, in the molecular size, uh, means that there is a more vesicles formed. This is by the chemistry you can monitor, or you can monitor by fluorescent. Normally, if you use a fluorescent LC3, it has a cytosolic localization, but when it's recruited on the membranes, start to be concentrated in the membranes, so it appears as bright spots on the, in the cell, and you can count these bright spots and normalize for the cross-section area or the area of your cell. This, each spot is a vesicle that is formed. It is forming or is already formed. Um, just to, be, uh, to show you our approach, uh, we are doing genetic manipulation for uh, generating knockout and genetic mice, but we can also transfect by electroporation adult muscle fiber of normal animals. Uh, and here you can see an example, you can inject uh, the uh, naked plasmid into a muscle and by electro electric field we can transfect muscle here with glymphosin protein and see which are the factors on mutant proteins or SHRNAs on the sides of the muscle uh, comparing the transfected fiber with a non-transfected fiber. Just to show what's happened when we activate FOXO, uh, uh, the pathway that is important for degradation and protein synthesis in muscle fiber, this are a fiber that has seven days in which a costity active FOXO3 was transfected into a muscle, and as you can see, they start to shrink, and the shrinkage is dramatic after two weeks. This is a cell that has a FOXO, costity active FOXO, compared to the surrounding untransfected fiber. In two weeks, you're losing more than 60% of the muscle mass of the, of, the, of the size of the mass of the myofiber. And why? What's happened to the ultrastructural level? So keep in mind that uh, in my fiber you have uh, uh, contratile elements. As I told you, there are mitochondria uh, be uh, between my fibrils, but we have two populations. One that is just beneath, beneath the sarcolemma, the plasma, uh, plasma membrane, is called the subsarcolemma mitochondria. And uh, you have also the intermyofibrillar mitochondria, it's important to sustain contraction. And when you've expressed 
Fox. So now the, the fiber dramatically change. You have vesicles that are engulfing mitochondria. The subsarcolar mitochondria almost disappear, and the intermifibrillar mitochondria they start to become smaller in size, and uh, from electron dense usually are electron dense by electron microscopy, they become electron pale. So there is a change in the morphology and in density of matrix in mitochondria, and some mitochondria are removed by autophagy. Uh, and uh, just to show you what's happened to a muscle that is extremely rich in mitochondria, this is a SDH staining, so in blue you can see mitochondria. This muscle is extremely rich in mitochondria, the solute muscle is a type 1 muscle fiber. And as you can see, the fiber that contains FOX3, red one, are completely empty of mitochondria. So you are losing mitochondria. In the meantime, the muscle becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. We want to analyze much more in details what's happened to the mitochondrial network in a living animal. So we move to a confocal imaging uh, using a, a peculiar uh, confocal microscopy. This is called a two-photon or multi-photon microscopy is using very long wavelength. This wavelength can excite uh, probes uh, in, in the tissue. So can uh, penetrate uh, 100 microns uh, uh, in depth and can excite fluorescent protein uh, in a tissue. So it's perfect to monitor fluorescent, uh, let's say mitochondria is labeled by fluorescent protein and see what's happening in a tissue. And this is the case, it's an animal that has been transfected with a mitochondrial target for and protein. And after several days from transfection, we expose the muscle, so the animal is under anesthesia, the muscle is exposed, uh, the blood perfusion is maintained, the innervation is maintained, we can do contraction, the body temperature is controlled. And we monitor by confocal microscope, which is how happens to the mitochondrial network in a normal condition or during muscle loss. And mainly, this is what, uh, happen, what it looks like in a control condition. This is a mitochondria YFP, is a matrix uh, mitochondria protein tagged with a fluorescent. And you can see the two populations, the intermifibrillar mitochondria that is, the, is doing this triation, and the subsarcolema mitochondria that are this kind of rod uh, elongation between sarcolema. And this mitochondria function because if we in inject a, a potential metric dye, tetramethyrhodamine, TMRM. This dye is uptaken only by mitochondria that maintains the membrane potential. So if mitochondria is functioning and lose membrane potential, the dye cannot come into the mitochondria. And as you can see, there's a perfect match in yellow between green and red, suggesting that we are labeling, we are transfecting mitochondria that are healthy and the transfection of in mitochondria not in other kind of organelles. So what's happening when you overspress FOXO and induce muscle atrophy? Now the network is dramatically changed. You lose completely the situation, and mitochondria start to change also in localization, but also in shape. And there are some mitochondria that are green and, and not anymore red, so suggesting that they have a depolarization mitochondria. And we can quantify that indeed, when we overspress mitochondria, you are losing membrane potential progressy if you block by oligomycin in the ATP synthase. So. This means that mitochondria, when you have muscle atrophy, you have a, a certain amount of mitochondria that are dysfunctioning and they are losing membrane potential uh, and, and they are using actually the, the ATP to maintain the membrane potential. So they are consuming, it's a sink for ATP, they are consuming ATP to maintain their membrane potential and this can have much more impact uh, into skeletal muscle signaling. So the question is why mitochondria, how mitochondria remove now the mitochondrial network is in red, and here you can see that the markers of autophagy, the LC3 with a fluorescent protein, and there are some vesicles that normally do not mesh with mitochondria in a normal condition. They're removing maybe proteins or, or glycogen or other organelles. But when we activate FOXO, now the mitochondrial network is dramatically changed. You increase the number of the vesicles, and now there are some vesicles that are yellow, that are engulfing mitochondria. So autophagy is important to remove the mitochondria during this atrophy condition or remodeling the network of mitochondria into a muscle fiber. And this happens also in normal condition, not only by when we express uh, FOXO. Uh, this is after fasting. When you're fasting or skipping the, the lunch or the dinner, you are not uh, burning your fat. But what will happen is that you're destroying your muscle fiber proteins because you are sustaining, releasing amino acid to sustain gluconeogenesis for the liver. 
So amino acids has to be, are destroy, uh, protein are destroyed, amino acids are released in the blood and are important for glucose to maintain uh, the glycemic glycemia uh, because the hepatocytes use the amino acid to produce new glucose. So skipping lunch is not good for your shape because you are losing protein of your muscle but not your adipose tissue. You need a prolonged fast in order to remove or lose your uh, white adipose tissue. So when you're fast, the animals for 24 hours, you're losing 20% of the muscle mass, just in 24 hours in mice. In, in humans, it's a little bit different. And uh, here in mitochondria, you change dramatically the mitochondrial network and you increase dramatically the number of vesicles that contains mitochondria. And if you block the lysosome, this is a way that you want to understand if lysosome is important for degradation by chlorokine, it's a, an agent that blocks the lysosome. Now you dramatically increase the size of the vesicles that contains almost a lot of these containing mitochondria, suggesting that indeed the vesicles are engulfed in mitochondria, delivered to the lysosome for, this, for the uh, uh, destruction of mitochondria. So the question is that. Uh, how a transcription factor can control the autophagy system, which are the genes, a transcription factor should control the genes that are important for the autophagy. And uh, just to show you the list of the autophilated genes, uh, in uh, these 100 of genes, uh, there are several that belong to the autophagy system. So when we monitor by real-time PCR, how these genes, if they are induced in two conditions, we are losing muscle mass, like fasting, and during disuse when you cut the sciatic nerve, so during denervation. You can see that there is a, a dramatic increase in most of the genes, even if the, is, there is a peculiar pattern that could be dependent from the different atrophy condition. Denervation, you have more LC3. Fasting, you have more GABA. But mainly, there is an upregulation of these genes. And these genes are important for different aspects of autophagy. LC3 is important, as I show you, to growth, to commit the membrane. More LC3 you have, bigger vesicles you have. But there are other genes that are important as regulatory, regular, 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 has functional regulation, regulatory function to control and activate the recruitment of LC3. And there are other genes that are important for the mitophagy to removal of mitochondria. And MNIP3 is what attract our attention for the mitochondria removal. And, but in order to be sure that these genes are really controlled and by FOXO and are controlled by AKT, we use a genetic approach, so we generate a muscle-specific AKT1 transgenic animals in which uh, the, the gene is under control of a, a promoter, but there is a stop sequence uh, flanked by two log speed sites. So when we cross with the mass transgenic animals that express the credit communities, only muscle, we remove uh, the stop sequence and now the promoter can transcribe the AKT gene. But the protein is an unstable protein because it's a fusion protein between AKT and estrogen receptor. And normally estrogen receptor is recognized by the H of proteins 90 and uh, makes the protein very unstable and, the, and induce degradation or blocks the phosphorylation by upstream kinase. Only when we inject tamoxifen, we can displace, remove the H of protein, we establish the protein, now the protein can be phosphorylated by upstream kinase. And this is what's happened by biochemistry. Tamoxifen injection, now the protein is more stable and can be phosphorylated by the upstream kinase, so it becomes active. And indeed, when we activate AKT in a muscle, specific muscle, we completely suppress the induction of the genes. Uh, and this induction of the gene is even maintained suppressing even when we block rapamycin with rapamycin mTOR, suggesting that FOXO can be the transcription factor important for the uh, upregulation of these genes. And BRIM3, as I told you, is important for the mitophagy. So we start to monitor if in BRIM3 promoter there was any FOXO binding sites, and indeed there were several FOXO binding sites, and by chromatin immunoprecipitation we can find that the FOXO was recruited on this peculiar binding site of BRIM3 promoter. So is BRIM3 sufficient to induce vesicle formation? When we have expressed BNIM3 with LC3 GFP, you can see that BNIM3 and its homologue, BNIM3L, increase the dots uh, into the muscle fiber, here the quantification. And it was also sufficient to induce a loss of muscle mass. Uh, there was a decrease in 20% in cross-sectional area. The size of muscle fiber shrink of 20% in two weeks. So the key experiment is what's happening if we block NIM3? Can we reduce uh, vesicle formation when we express FOXO? 
and two different oligos were both able to reduce the vesicles induced by FOXO3 in, in muscle fiber and living animals and reduce the lipidation of LC3, suggesting that indeed the pathways are require the activation by FOXO of these two genes in order to activate autophagy and induce the mitochondrial remodeling uh, and the change in the network uh, uh, during muscle atrophy. So uh, up to now, we, we, at that time, we believe that, so that this tube degradation system could have a major impact on muscle mass, so we decided to say, okay, what's happening if we block the autophagy system? Can we in some way spare muscle mass? Can we prevent muscle loss and so have a benefit to the physiology of the muscle? And what's happened to the mitochondrial network? Can we preserve mitochondrial loss? <coughs> Just to remind you that the lipidation step between LC3 and the lipids is very complex procedure. And there are several steps in which different uh, ubiquitin-like molecule has to be activated by energy and mainly the reaction is a, a required different class of enzyme. First of all, it requires energy. Without energy, you cannot activate autophagy like apoptosis. You can have apoptosis if you don't have energy. So by the hydrolysis of ATP, the small ubiquitin-like protein start to be activated by the class of E1 enzyme called the activating enzyme. And then the E1 enzyme is moving the small ubiquitin-like, in this case called ATG12, to the E2 enzyme, the conjugation system. And now, then, the conjugation system is moving, like the ubiquitin proteasome system, uh, the uh, small ubiquitin-like, uh, to the final E3 enzyme. And E3 enzyme is formed by this gene ATG5 and ATG12 that is associated with ATG16. And this enzyme is required for the following activation of the latter ubiquitin-like, the ATG8 that again is activated by the E1 enzyme, is moved to the E2 enzyme, and then only in presence of the E3 can be moved the ATG8 to the lipids, become, so marking the membranes to become vesicles. If you don't have this step, you don't have any membranes growing. But as you can see, both the pathway has in common only one gene, this gene, ATG7. So if we remove the G7, we completely suppress the membrane commitment and suppress the autophagism formation. So we did a uh, genetic approach. We use the uh, at G7 with two log speed side. We cross with the muscle-specific credit combinase and we delete at G7 only in skeletal muscle, not in other tissue. Just to remind you the two markers, change in molecular weight and lipid drops for the vesicle formation. And as you can see now, in a muscle in which ATG7 was completely deleted, there is no LC3 lipidator. Only unlipidated LC3 is present. ATG7 is maintaining other tissue, including heart. It's, important. it's very important. Cardiac is still ATG7. We want to be sure that we also prevent the destruction of the autophagy substrate. And P62 is a protein, is, important, is a bona fide autophagy substrate. This protein is able to bind the polybutene protein by UBA domain and is able to bind LC3 to this domain called LRS or LIR, LIR or LRS domain, recruiting ubiquitin proteins to the vesicles. And mainly what's happening, when you have a damage to the protein, the proteins start to be ubiquitinated and are recognized by P62 that is binding the polybutene chain and is bringing the polybutene protein to LC3, the membranes start to grow and surround the PCC2 protein and the ubiquitinated protein into a vesicle. And the vesicle then is moved to the elasmus system, fuse, and you're losing uh, the protein ubiquitinated P62 and LC3. But if you block the LC3, now the protein P62 start to accumulate in the cell, and this protein has an oligomerization domain. So start to do protein aggregates that are positive for ubiquitin. So we look at the level of P62, and as you can see in autophagy knockout animals, the accumulation of P62 that is inducing aggregates into the muscle fiber. So this is immunostaining for P62, a control condition, and in autophagy knockout, you can see now uh, spots for P62, and these spots are positive for ubiquitin. 
So we can say that our autophagy knockout block the vesicle formation and prevents the degradation of the substrate for the autophagy lysosome system. What happens with muscle fiber? We believe that muscle should be spared from muscle loss, but surprising, if you look at the size of the muscle in a control condition wild type animal and the size of the muscle in autophagy knockout, now the muscle becomes smaller, as smaller. Not only as smaller, but the nuclei that normally are just beneath the sarcolemma, are not in the center, start to accumulate in the center of muscle fiber. And when you have a nuclear in the center of muscle fiber, this suggests a myopathy, a condition of muscle degeneration, like a muscle dystrophy. And indeed, the number of center nucleated fiber increase with the age from two months to two years. Not only the muscle has a center nucleated, but there are was uh, in an uh, old animal, two years, this very tiny, smaller muscle at, uh, fiber that are really uh, small and sometimes flatten, suggesting or assembling an, an atrophy induced by disease like denervation. And moreover, you have accumulation of hemato hematoxylin positive aggregates uh, or also some vacuoles that I don't show here. And mainly, in two years, you are losing 70% of your muscle mass. More than half of your muscle in this animal are lost in two years. Two years old of mice, this look like a, a man of uh, 80, 84 years old. So what about the force? We measure muscle force in our autophagy cow, so this is a, a, a sleepy animal, so a, the animal, mice is under anesthesia. We block the knee and we block the, fo the, the food on a food plate. Now we can st stimulate the sciatic nerve to induce contraction and we can monitor with a, s a computer setup the force that are generated by the contraction of the gastrocnemius muscle. And usually, this is a typical force frequency curve in which increasing the frequency of stimulation, you increase the force uh, till reaching a plateau, it's called the titanic force, when it let you feel or recruit all the muscle fiber of your muscle. So this is the maximal force that each muscle can generate. And as you can see, the autophagy knockout, the force is dramatically impaired, both in females and males. But there is a general issue, females are much, much more affected, it's much weaker and atrophic than males. So just to remind you that we have two different fiber types, uh, the glycolytic with mitochondria that are poor, and the type 1 that are extremely rich in mitochondria. And mitochondria can be detected by SDH staining. The type 1 fiber is this blue fiber, while the type 2 fiber are this white fiber. And normally muscle are a mix of different fiber, but in autophagy knockout, uh, now you have accumulation of mitochondria and all the muscle fiber become blue, not only become blue, but normally the mitochondria, you can see these uh, spots are mitochondria in the intermyofibrillar mitochondria. Now the spots dramatically increase in the size. So you have accumulation of mitochondria that looks that are bigger than in control animals if you block the autophagy system. And when we monitor the mitochondria by electron microscopy, in a control condition, mitochondria are just well aligned to the Z line in the band that contain actin. But now here mitochondria are giant. They are spanning from one Z band to the next Z band, they are spanning for all the sarcomer. And the matrix is very electron pale, it's not anymore electron dense. And you have this swollen mitochondria with the alteration in the and Mitochondria are degenerating, and I'm going to show form of this kind of membranes round. And these are protein aggregates that start to accumulate in between my fibrils, uh, making curving my fibrils or destroying my fibrils. And this uh, accumulation of membranes is greatly affecting the, the number of contractile elements. So you are losing contractile elements and you have accumulation of the round membrane bodies uh, with, that mainly are coming may, may be from, mainly from mitochondria, but also from sarcoplasmic reticulum. Not only mitochondria are normal in shape, but there are also a protein, uh, alteration in oxidative stress. Uh, if we monitor the oxidized protein by monitoring the carbonylation of the protein, in autophagy knockout, you have an increase uh, in the carbonylation. So you start to accumulate uh, abnormal mitochondria to release reactive oxygen species that uh, oxidize protein. And this has a major impact in uh, protein, uh, in, the, in the strength of the muscle. And uh, not only you have a problem in mitochondria, you have a protein problem also in uh, ER, because now you start to have an unfolding protein response. So when you have a problem in folding, you activate this chaperone called BIP uh, that phosphorylates this initiation factor that blocks the ribosomal assembly, you reduce protein synthesis. 
And indeed, in our autophagy cardiac, have increased in the chaperone, suggesting there was an unfolding protein response. And you have dramatic phosphorylation inhibition, this initiation factor that anymore is not able no, now to in, we reduce protein synthesis in, in autophagy deficient muscle. So mainly, uh, is it true that proteasome and autophagy lysosome are affecting protein synthesis and protein degradation and are affecting muscle mass? But if you block the lysosome in the autophagy system, you have now a problem to different organelles in the muscle fiber and uh, to protein aggregates clearance. And this, uh, if you reduce this uh, lysosome degradation, now you start to accumulate different stress in the cell that leads to myopathy. Just to keep in mind that normally this happens uh, in our, these genes are a circadian rhythm. So when you, during the day, you move, you go to the gym, you eat, uh, this part is active and is pro promoting protein synthesis. And at the same time, it's suppressing the autophagy lysosome and the protein and you start to accumulate protein in the cell. But when you go to, the, to sleep, uh, now we don't eat anymore, our insulin levels start to decrease, uh, you don't exercise your muscle, this part is down, protein synthesis down, and now you activate, you activate the degradation pathway to remove all what is, has been damaged during the, the, the day, the contraction activity, all what has been produced and is an unfolded, not correctly folded in the, in the muscle fiber. Can this be true also in a genetic disease or in myopathy or in dystrophies that has an impact in a human being? Collagen 6 is a um, genetic uh, disease in which uh, uh, the absence or the uh, not uh, uh, redu reduced, reduced level of collagen 6 triggered two different genetic diseases, the Bethlehem myopathy and the uric dystrophy. Bethlehem is milder because it has still some collagen 6. Uh, uric is very severe in which there is almost no collagen 6. And all these conditions uh, are characterized by alteration in mitochondrial morphology and in sarcoplasmic reticular distension in patient, in skeletal muscle of patient and uh, collagen 6 knockout animals. And this mitochondria is a major feature of this myopathy or dystrophy, are dysfunctional because they're losing membrane potential, like I show you when we were stressed FOXO, and this trigger apoptotic cell death, an apoptotic generation. So these animals and the passion has an abnormal mitochondria that induce uh, release of cytochrome C, activation of apoptosis that leads to myofibril degeneration. But why mitochondria are such abnormal and you have in your muscle fiber this abnormal mitochondria? I told you and I show you that autophagy knockout and autophagy system is important for the uh, removal of mitochondria. Remind, remember that LC3 is a marker. So we monitor level LC3 in our by the shift in molecular weight. We monitor the level of LC3 in our collagen 6 uh, knockout animals, and now you can see that there is no lipidation anymore, suggesting an impermanent autophagy cyst, autophagy formation in this uh, dystrophy. Just to monitor a little bit better the autophagy, we starved the animals. Remind, I, remi I remember you that uh, you are, if you are feeding, you suppress the autophagy. If you are fasting, you activate the autophagy. And when we fast the animals, we monitor the vesicle. This is an autophagosome. That this is a double membrane that's engulfing two mitochondria and a sarcoplasmic reticulum. And if, when we counted the number of vesicles, we found that in collagen 6 knockout animals, there was an impairment in the vesicles. There were much, much less vesicles than the uh, wild type. So the lack of LC3-2 and lack of autophagosome can be due to an impaired autophagy, as I showed you and told you but can be also due to an excessive autophagy that autophagy are immediately formed and suddenly destroyed. A very fast turnover of the vesicles. How we can monitor this? We can monitor by looking at the substrate autophagy. As I told you, P62 is a substrate. So if you have an impairment in autophagy, you have accumulation P62 and you have a high level P62. If you have too much degradation, P62 is removed, so you have decreasing P62 level. And indeed, in the fa in a, when you fast uh, the animals in your muscle, you're losing P62 as expected. At the same time, you have lipidation. But in collagen 6, you have accumulation of P62, suggesting that between the two possibility, this is the true impaired autophagy accumulation of P62. But just to be sure, we decide to destroy the lasom system by cryokine. And if we destroy this system, now we should accumulate uh, all the vesicles, including LC32. 
So when we treat the animal with chloroquine, we accumulate in a wild type, we have accumulation of LC32, but this doesn't help really, or a very mild induction in collagen 6, suggesting that again, this is the problem in this collagen 6 knockout animals. So the vesicles, before you form the vesicles, you require some signal, and the signals are coming from the recruitment of this complex to the membrane. So we look at the level of Becri-1 and VPS-34 in our collagen-6, and you can see that now this complex is completely down-regulated, or very strongly down-regulated in collagen-6 knockout animals. And as I told you, BNIM-3 is important for the mitophagy, so we look at BNIM-3, and again also BNIM-3 is down in collagen-6 knockout animals. So low backlin, low BNIM-3, induced low level autophagy and accumulation of abnormal organelles and myofibrillar degeneration. In order to address which of these is important, we knock down selective backlin 1 and BNIM3 in control animals and see if now we can mimic the same level of uh, collagen 6 uh, knockout, uh, same level of, of apoptosis like in collagen 6 knockout animals. And when we knock down backlin 1, we induce apoptosis in the wild type, not in collagen 6 because they are already down, backlin 1 is already down. While BNIM3 induce only a trend induction, but not significant induction, suggesting that between two, Becklin-1 is the most important. And indeed, when we look at the muscle biopsy of Uric and Betlin, you can see that Becklin is dramatically reduced and is absent in Uric patient or in Betlin myopathy. So, can we restore Becklin-1 in three level? And can we restore autophagy and remove a mitochondria and rescue the muscle phenotype? We did a three different approaches, a nutritional, a pharmacological, and a genetic approach to restore the different proteins. A genetic was the simplest one. We overexpressed Becklin-1 in the muscle fiber, and you can see now the dots are formed, and we dramatically reduced the apoptotic, the apoptosis in the collagen-6 knockout animals to the normal level. The nutritional was the, uh, pretty tricky because it can be, uh, the nutrition can affect different important, uh, different aspects in nutrition, glyc uh, glucose, lipids, protein. We decided the protein because the protein are the most important regulator of autophagy. We decrease the protein level in the diet, uh, maintaining the caloric intake uh, at the same level between the two diets. Uh, and we, for four weeks, and we look at autophagy, apoptosis, and muscle phenotype, and indeed, uh, the caloric restriction of restore lipidation of LC3, restore Becklin-1 uh, and BNIM3 level to a control condition like the wild type. Not only restore the level, but now the abnormal organelle, the, the abnormal mitochondria, the abnormal sarcoplasmic reticulum are almost clear. There's no more abnormal organelle in muscle. And the mitochondria now are not anymore dysfunctioning. We remove the dysfunctional mitochondria and we decrease the apoptotic cell death in these animals just by changing the diet and reactivating the autophagy system. And the final, most important, the force was completely restored. The maximal force, the tonic force, the collagen cysts are extremely weak, but just changing the diet, we almost normalize the force to a control condition. The last that can be used in, clean, in, in practice is the pharmacological approach. Uh, there is a kinase, it's a nutrient-sensitive sen kinase mTOR that blocks the autophagy, and we can block mTOR with a drug called rapamycin, and so we can uh, reactivate the autophagy. So we treat uh, for two, two weeks uh, with rapamycin. As you can see now, the abnormal mitochondria and the sarcoplasmic reticulum are almost normally clear. Mitochondria are removed by autophagy. The myofibrillar with the abnormal mitochondria dramatically decrease and uh, the apoptosis is reduced in collagen-6 knockout animals. So mainly, imperial autophagy, as I show you, has a major impact in, in homeostasis and muscle fiber, and if you have imperial autophagy, you can have a disease, uh, muscle dystrophies, uh, myopathies, uh, uh, weakness. Um, you can restore the autophagy system by different approaches, genetic or low-protein diet, nutritional, or uh, by drugs, uh, and you can reactivate and remove abnormal mitochondria, and now your muscles start to be in a good shape uh, and a better functioning, and you can have a rescue of your uh, this drug phenotype. So skipping a, a, a meal uh, ever some time is uh, good for your muscle, even if they become a little bit smaller, but it could be uh, an approach important to, to remove uh, uh, the garbage that you are accumulating, because uh, you can say that uh, there is a normal meiostasis of muscle fiber that requires uh, a certain level of autophagy. If you have too much autophagy, you have atrophy and you have a weakness. But if you have uh, inhibition of autophagy, 
less autophagy. Now you trigger another condition that is even worse than this one. You accumulate garbages that leads to a myofibrillar degeneration or myopathy or dystrophies that is much uh, induce uh, extremely weakness in your muscle fiber. And this is the most important slide of the, my talk, the task force in my lab that contribute to, the, to these findings. Uh, Vanina Romanello is the postdoc who studied the mitochondria changes in the network in living animals during muscle atrophy. Eva is a PhD student, now postdoc in, uh, in, uh, in London, uh, that generate the autophagy knockout animals while they study. Uh, now Silvia is taking care about the aging uh, and autophagy knockout animals. Uh, and uh, 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 Luisa and Enrico uh, performed the experiments on the collagen 6 and the story of collagen 6 knockout animals. Uh, and, um, autophagy. And these are all the collaborators in which we are uh, sharing reagents uh, and information and news uh, about uh, the signaling in skeletal muscle. And thanks for your attention.